Hello, Kristen. Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm good. Are you are you geared up for Thanksgiving? I am. I'm actually headed up uh, your way. I'm going to be spending Thanksgiving in Massachusetts. Very exciting. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, in which which part? Uh, it's good, like the suburbs outside of Boston, um, so kind of like halfway between Boston and Worcester. Yep. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to it because Black Friday is perhaps one of my favorite holidays of the year. <laughs> um, it's where the real crazy gets to come out, and I get to go out shopping at midnight and just like social norms and customs go out the window. It's just mayhem. Do you have Very a good? Great. Do you have a good left hook on Black Friday? <laughs> Well, the other thing is I, I, I strategically choose not to go for things that I know are going to be like, like I'm not going to wait in line for a heavily discounted iPad. Or mm -hmm. What I do is I go and I just sort of look for like the deals that people are missing. People aren't like noticing that it's a really good deal and that it's something that I need. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as I keep, I've been at this long enough to know, <laughs> you know, don't go crazy, but you can find like a few diamonds in the rough that make the whole hellacious experience totally worth it. I'd say you should write some sort of blog post with your Black Friday strategy, but I imagine that you'd be giving away the game. Uh, you know, I might I might wind up uh, trying to, you know, after the fact, uh, maybe do a rundown of, of lessons learned from this year. What have I built upon my, my, my body of knowledge? Like, what what new things did I pick up this year at the Rentham Outlets in, uh, in Massachusetts? <laughs> well, Rick, so we're, we're happy to have you. Well, and, uh, maybe get a flavor <laughs> of the of the Scott Brandles with the Warren festivities. Um, oh, also, is there sales tax in Massachusetts? <laughs> you know, that's I'm, a yes. I think there's none on clothes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very complicated sales tax, and there are a lot of exemptions to it. Oh, um, okay. And so I don't actually know offhand uh, what applies and what doesn't, but it does exist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it would apply to simpler items, but if I go out and buy some extremely <laughs> unnecessary, ridiculous pair of shoes, perhaps they're not trying to give tax breaks to the... Well, people who people who waste money on things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before you uh, get on the plane or train or whatever uh, transport of choice, uh, I imagine you had a chance to process uh, the Republican presidential debate on on a Tuesday evening. I did. I did. Um, as have a variety of bloggers. Um, I only watched, I, I watched most of it, but was missing bits and pieces because I was uh, in like a hotel lobby bar on a business trip trying to, to catch it. And I was the only one there that was really interested in this debate. Uh, but from what I caught, um, it seemed as though Newt Gingrich, with one big exception, <laughs> which we'll get to in a moment, uh, did very, seem to solidify in many ways this the, this front runner ish status. Um, he gave very, I thought, competent, complex answers to questions. Um, I think part of his appeal is that he he likes to be counterintuitive and he likes to have an answer that's more complex than the talking point that the other folks on the stage have probably all rehearsed. What happened to the Republicans of all that liked simple answers? No, no more eggheads. Quit with your stupid nuance. That's the Republicans I miss. Oh, well, I mean, they're still out there. Uh, you know, and I mean, I think... I think a lot of what you saw if, at first with Michelle Bachman doing so well was that, you know, she had the sort of well-polished, quick talking point. I mean, she still, even last night, had some line like, Pakistan is too nuclear to fail. I mean, a little catchphrase and, like, you know, cute statement still works for some people, and it's it's their shtick, but it's never been Newt's shtick. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, at this point, folks are just willing in many ways to put the baggage aside and say, I want the smartest guy in the room. Um, Rich Lowry at the corner at National Review um, declared Newt wins for now. Newt was commanding, showing his decades of engagement with these issues. He seemed less irritable than usual and at ease with his new place of prominence in the race. No one can match his combination of substance and pungent expression. Um, and also sort of liked that Newt doesn't really, or at least in this debate, didn't throw out a bunch of red meat. Um, that that's sort of been the way that other folks who have tried to rise up to become the Romney alternative, that they've done this by throwing out, you know, either simplistic talking points like a Herman Cain or throwing out red meat uh, like a Rick Perry saying Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. Um, that instead, Newt is doing neither, neither of those things and is managing to sort of through sheer force of brain power, um, draw people in, draw people into his campaign. 
um, and really against all odds, uh, considering that you know it's been over the last two weeks. You've had the, the Freddie Mac money issue. You've got questions: Did he lobby for pharma? You know, where, he's got his Newt Inc. All of his Politico ran a big piece about all of his side corporations and things and think tanks and how he's raised money and you know accrued personal wealth through speaking fees and, and consulting. So, but, but with all of that said. I think you've just got a lot of Republican voters who are thinking, I just want the smartest guy. I, I don't care that he's not throwing red meat. I don't care about the wives. I don't care about any of this stuff. He's the guy that gets up on stage in these debates and talks like somebody that I want to vote for for president. Now, can, so, you, can you explain this to me? Because I thought that the Republican narrative was that Barack Obama was an idiot, uh, unqualified, in over his head, uh, probably got bad grades in school, uh, only got elected because of white guilt and needs to use a teleprompter. Why now this, this, this I mean, a new space to make the ar argument, you need somebody as smart as me to go toe to toe with him. Why, why is that? If Obama is someone who is so reliant on the teleprompter? Well, I think, I think one, he thinks that it would set up a good contrast that if, if Obama is a slick debater, but not necessarily a very substantive debater, that Newt manages to both be slick and substantive, and that therefore you need someone who can beat him on the substance, but match him on the delivery. And that contrasts with a lot of the other folks. I, I, I assume Newt would be you know, trying to contrast himself with someone like a Herman Cain, who can probably make some you know, slick remarks in a debate, some punchy lines um, to get people riled up. You know, which is why he was partially a you know a front runner for a little while there, um, but that ultimately, I mean, I think it actually feeds exactly into that narrative that that last time around, America took a chance on a guy who didn't have experience in this sort of leadership for very long, and as a result, look, the country's got nine percent unemployment; it's all Obama's fault. If only we had elected someone as smart as Newt Gingrich, perhaps we wouldn't be in this position. So I think that's sort of the subtext of that argument um, for why Newt would why people would make the case that Newt is um, both the smartest guy in the room, wonky, but but ultimately electable um, and, and would set up a good contrast in a debate. Now, that assumes that Newt shows up to these debates and is the thoughtful, positive, um, substantive guy he can be and kind of was in this debate this week. Um, alternatively, there is plenty of opportunity for it to go the other way. Um, Newt is not always perfect. Sometimes, Newt, frequently, Newt <laughs> sticks his foot in his mouth. And so uh, it just sort of depends on which Newt is showing up. And provided that the Newt we saw on Tuesday night keeps showing up, I think he does have a chance to solidify this frontrunner status, even given his massive amounts of baggage. Now, where um, do you think this notion, uh, you know, taking Obama out of the equation for a second, I just want to get this back to sort of a, a, a you know, how conservative blogs are, are contributing to um, uh, base voter understanding. Because uh, this notion that you need the smartest, best debater uh, has has never been a criteria, I feel, at any presidential primary in, all, in, in, any, in either party. It's really, never been this dominant theme, and it's become that all of a sudden. Uh, it, can you can you ascertain where does it come from? Is it is it a conservative blog premise that's been pushed out? Is it conservative talk radio premise? Is it just Newt himself making the argument? And people are just buying his argument. I think the way the place the argument comes from is if you look just look at the power of the debates in this primary. I mean, folks with no money and no organization are able to rocket very quickly to the top of polls because these debates are the vehicle for getting ideas out there. Now, in a general election, that could be it's likely to be very different. Obama's got a ton of money. Um, the RNC will have a ton of money. Whoever the nominee is will likely be able to raise a lot. I mean, there's going to be tons of paid media going on in this next race. Um, so I think the, the fact that the debates in this primary have emerged is so important may be a sign that folks think, uh, you know, that voters aren't paying attention to the paid ads as much, and they really want to see a discussion of ideas, um, but I, I think it could be that because the debates have wound up being so prominent in the primary, folks are assuming they will maintain that level of prominence in the general. Now, is it is it possible? Uh, for, forgive me for asking a whole bunch of leading questions down my preferred garden path. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, it, it feels to me like 
you know, the, the left has always been very jealous of the right's echo chamber, that, that it's, it has this very effective media apparatus that, that gets uh, ideas and themes and means into the wider uh, discourse and, and have tried to replicate that for a very long time. Uh, but this, it feels like what's going on now, again, I don't know how the race is going to turn out, so it's probably premature to draw any conclusions, uh, uh, that these, these premises are being passed around without a lot of historical basis. Uh, because there is there is a this deep concern that uh, the Republicans won't uh, nominate someone who is electable, and this is the kind of weird place Democrats were in in 2004, where we, we tied ourselves to the knots, thinking about who's the most electable person, and and landed on the notion that Kerry's the most electable because he's a veteran, <laughs> and, that, and that that would make him immune to all Karl Rove attacks, which was a ludicrous proposition, but that's what we came up with. Uh, is it possible the Republicans are about to do the same thing because they're making up this criteria to whole cloth and feeding it to each other through uh, the conservative blogosphere, conservative talk radio apparatus, and they're going to find out too late that they were making decisions based on faulty criteria? Well, possibly, but I think that also uh, implies that a lot of folks this time around are interested in voting for the most electable person, and I think all of those folks uh, are, or most of those folks are the Romney types. Um, the, the folks who are really like electability is their number one thing going into this primary. I mean, they're sort of already, you know, looking at all of these polls that are showing Romney as as the strongest contender, and, and that's where they're sort of falling. So I, I don't necessarily. I think the electability argument is a way for folks who are already naturally inclined to support Newt to then say, "Hey, all you Romney people, your primary reason for supporting him is no longer just limited to him." Um, so by creating new electability criteria, like if, if, if Romney's criteria is, or if Romney's electability case is based on he's an attractive, well-spoken guy with a lot of money um, who knows how to, he knew how to succeed in a blue state and is going to be able to, um, you know, bring all of the parts of the Republican coalition together. If, if that's your argument for him, you can't really make that same argument for Newt. He doesn't have a big war chest. He's not some, you know, good-looking guy. Um, who who governed in a you know I mean he was kind of he was pretty divisive as speaker, uh, so there if if you are trying to make an electability case for Newt you have to use different criteria, uh, so this whole you know I don't think there have been a lot of folks that have made a very strong case that Romney's electability is based on his ability to wipe the floor with Obama in debates. I, I think some people think that that may happen, but I don't think that forms the crux of that case, whereas for Newt, this is something where if you're looking for a reason to support Newt, and you're trying to make the case that he that he's not going to be a complete disaster in a general, you can point to the debating and, and, and create that as your key criteria. And I think that there may be some validity to it, precisely because the debates wound up being so weirdly important this time around. And maybe that's because there is a blogosphere and there is Twitter where, you know, I, you know, memes, you know, ideas can be put out there in this debate and instantaneously they're circulated everywhere. The, mean, the mainstream journalists are picking up on it. Oh, Eric Erickson tweeted X, Y, or Z. This must be what is going on. Clearly Perry failed in this debate. I mean, it's creating, these debates have created mainstream media narratives in a much more powerful way, I think in part because of blogs and because of Twitter. Uh, so it's, it, is, it is a new made-up criteria, but I don't think that necessarily means that it's wrong. I think we will see these debates be, have a big impact, a much bigger impact, I think, than you saw with Bush, with Bush Kerry or with, with Bush Gore. Um, or even, you know, McCain-Obama. I, you know, I, thinking back on those debates, I'm not positive that I can say, you know, wow, one of those candidates really wiped the floor with the other. That was decisive in the election. But I think it could be different this time around. Now, um, you, you uh, alluded to this when you, when you started the, the segment about uh, Newt's performance in the debate. The, the big exception was the fact that he came out with a, a nuanced position on, on immigration where he said we would have some kind of uh, board or, or a series of community boards across the country that would go through currently undocumented workers case by case and decide if you were good enough to stay or you had to go. Uh, and putting aside the practicality of that suggestion, uh, it was uh, uh, seen as being a, a somewhat of a step to the left in that he was saying that, that not everyone currently here would have to be kicked out automatically. Uh, and that has always been kind of the pragmatic argument that 
um, folks on the left and the uh, sort of corporate right uh, ha have said, you know, it, there's just no way you're kicking out, you know, 10 million plus people at once. It's not, it's, it's not physically possible. Uh, but to utter that in a Republican primary debate has tended not to uh, win you any friends. Uh, are, are conservative bloggers turning on Newt because of this, or are they, or are they, or are they rationalizing it? Um, I was very surprised when I was watching the debate. I heard him make that statement, and I thought, "This is going to cost him ten to thirteen points in Iowa." This, oh wow, I can't believe he he just said this. Um, not that I disagreed fundamentally with his, with you know, it, it wasn't that I had like a negative personal reaction to his position. It was just I, I immediately thought of the political consequences of what he had said. Um, and proceeded to check Twitter and sort of the usual suspects um, that I would expect to really go after Nudity Melissa Clothier was one of them who, uh, you know, the sort of folks who I think of as, as like the true conservatives in, that I follow on Twitter, I was expecting them to all pounce on it. And there were some, Katie Pavlich of Town Hall immediately, uh, you know, sort of jumped on it, especially Newt's use of the word humane to describe his policy, the implication being if you don't support him, you're inhumane, um, which is sort of what tripped Perry up a little bit when he said that you were heartless if you didn't support his view, and that kind of got him into, that's part of what really ticked off conservatives. So there were some who, who you know, were, were upset about his, his statement or his framing of his position as humane, but others, I think I mentioned Melissa, and there were, um, it, it, there were a lot that were posting that this was, Interesting, but it wasn't as far away from what they believed as had been thought. And the difference here from the, between what Newt proposed and amnesty is that, or, or what we think of as amnesty, is it's there's no path to citizenship, um, and it's not like there's some. I think he's trying this whole community boards thing. I think came up after the debate uh, with his spokesman talking in the in the spin room. Um, you know, he's trying to square, how do you not make this a big federal, you know, how do you deal with this as a, in the federal role? Um, but I think uh, if you, all the pundit at Hot Air sort of made a case for why this both is and isn't like Perry's uh, moment, when Perry made a case for his Texas version of the DREAM Act, I mean, he really took a hit. Um, I don't know to what extent that fueled his decline in the polls. I mean, there's been lots of things that could have fueled it, but uh, the what what Ala Pundit says is what you're seeing here, in fact, is a rewrite of uh, Perry's latter, uh, Perry's infamous point about heartlessness by a guy who's just much slicker at debating. Neither one is endorsing citizenship for illegals, just greater integration of those who have been here long enough that uprooting them would cause great personal disruption. Gingrich's position is arguably more defensible than Perry's, since he's not calling for any taxpayer subsidies. Perry's is arguably more defensible than Gingrich's, since he's focused on kids who were brought here by their parents, not people who crossed the border illegally of their own volition. I think Newt's going to get away with this, partly because of the difference in tone. His answer seems even milder than it is, thanks to the standard set by Perry's heartless remark, and partly, partly because, as we get closer to the general, the base will tolerate a bit more centrism on immigration in the name of wooing Hispanics in the general. We nominated McCain, didn't we? Uh, so there's another electability argument um, sort of emerging out of this uh, in favor of, of Gingrich and why, you know, folks who support him can make the case to others, hey, if you like him, it's okay to back him. He won't be a disaster in the general. Um, that, that not only is his position something that's a little more general friendly, but particularly to the Latino community, um, Gingrich has actually always been really into outreach to the Latino community. He has a site, uh, the Americano, that's uh, sort of like a, a blog focused on, um, you know, Latino conservatives. And so this is nothing new. I mean, Newt is a savvy guy. And uh, I think it's interesting that you can really see in the debates he's not, he's not, uh, just running in a primary. I mean, he's running on these ideas that he knows may may harm him in Iowa. Uh, so I, I think I, I've been surprised because I really thought there was going to be heavy conservative backlash against it, and there really hasn't been. Um, there have been some that, that think it was bad, but there are. But in general, those folks may have already had other candidates, or they were already had misgivings about him because of the, the Freddie money or um, his, his other positions. There are other things folks that have already had misgivings about Gingrich's conservative bona fides, um, in part, you know, Philip Klein had a piece this week about Gingrich flunks the Al Sharpton test. Because um, remember, I mean, he's, he went on an education tour with Al Sharpton, he did a climate change ad, you know, sitting on a couch next to Nancy Pelosi. Um, so there are folks who are already skeptical of him. If you were already skeptical, this confirmed your skepticism. But if you were on the fence, or this is what I think is the bigger thing, if you were a Romney voter but you weren't sold, and you were trying to see if there's anybody else up there who is electable, 
um, it's possible that, that Newt's sort of breakaway on immigration could convince you otherwise. Um, I think you kind of could see Romney smirking in that moment, and already the Romney campaign has come out hard to say, you know, Newt has, is backing amnesty, and this isn't what, what Romney would, would support. Um, so clearly the campaign has s noticed that this could both be a liability and an asset to Gingrich, and they're trying very hard to make sure that he doesn't turn this into um, a way to erode his, that this doesn't become something that will erode Romney's uh, establishment support. Right. And uh, as Nate Silver, uh, blogging at the New York Times' 538 site, pointed out, uh, Republican voters themselves ha are not of one mind on immigration. 42% um, of Republicans say immigrants should be required to leave, but 31% say they should be able to stay and apply for citizenship, and 23% say they should be allowed to stay but as guest workers. So you have a majority of Republicans saying, we do not think immigrants should be required to leave. So Gingrich is not actually out of step with the Republican voters, voters as a whole, although that's not necessarily the same as who's going to show up to the Iowa caucuses. Uh, so it, it's a little fuzzy uh, how it might impact him, but it's not. But the, the presumption that it would be uh, a death knell is not quite there in the numbers, it would appear. Yeah, and immigration is incredibly difficult as far as uh, polling goes. It, it's, it's a tough topic to poll on um, because whenever you're dealing with anything involving race or culture, um, you know, there are folks that you know, maybe are uncomfortable telling their, their true views to a pollster or haven't fully, you know, thought through the implications of things. I mean, even many of the candidates on both the Republican and Democratic sides don't have good answers to the question of what do you do with the millions of people who are here? So if people running for office don't have that answer, uh, you know, how it, it's, it's sort of unfair to expect Americans to all have clear, rigid, defined positions on what do you do about the, you know, 11, 12 million people who are here. So polling on stuff like this is really complicated, and you can find numbers that support um, this is a, a savvy move on Newt Gingrich's part, and it's not so far from where most Republicans are, and you can find plenty of polls that show that this could be really bad for Newt. Um, I think what remains to be seen is, you know, let's let's look at what these Iowa polls show a week from now and see, um, see if, if his otherwise you know, sort of unequivocally strong uh, debate performance was was enough, or if if this immigration thing really begins to set, to sink him. Now, uh, were conservatives paying attention to anybody else in the debate last night, or is all the attention just focused on, on Newt? Um, no, I mean there was attention paid to sort of everyone, uh, though I think most was focused on either Newt, on Newt and Romney, um, because. The, the, the uh, David Frum at Frum Forum says, Tuesday night was a bad night for Mitt Romney, maybe the very worst of any of these debates. Started out badly with a joke about Mitt being his real first name when it was not and ended badly with a weak answer about unexpected threats that did not play at all to Romney's strengths on international economics. In Frum's post, uh, he mentions that the audience for this debate, I mean, this was a debate held in Washington, D.C., of conservative, wonky think tank types. So it's a lot of your establishment elite blah, 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 types in the room. And uh, from notes that the hall was packed to the rafters with DC think tank establishment types, it ought to have been effortless mid territory, and it was not. People in the hall know well, all too well, Gingrich's manifold flaws and weaknesses, yet they warm to him, ready to receive him back, not just because they trust him, but because he excites them. Um, and that was sort of Rich Lowry's take, too, that Romney was fine, but wasn't quite as, as good as usual. Um, which, which may not be a problem as long as there, you know, there were no major gaffes and maybe that's, that's all he needs to ask for. But with Gingrich performing very well, whenever you've had the Romney and the not Romney go at it, and it the Romney, whenever you've had <laughs> Romney and his, his front runner alternative sort of go face to face in a debate, there's never been a time in any of these debates where the alternative has outperformed Romney strongly. Um, it's always been a sense that it's either been a draw or that Romney did fine and the front runner made some sort of mistake that, that will, will cost them greatly. Right. I mean, is Whereas, that ever been because Romney is so awesome or is it because the other guy's always been just completely ridiculous? Um, you know, I think Romney's a good debater, but I think you often find that, you know, you've, you've had Herman Cain, you know, kind of make make some flubs, you have Perry make lots of flubs, you know, I think it's, it's been a mixture of the two. Um, in this case, this was a debate where Romney was about as, I think, as about as good as, as he usually is, maybe maybe a little bit less, maybe a little off his game, but, it, you know, I thought generally Romney did fine and had good answers, um, but it was that his alternative was outshining him that was 
Um, that is why this is being painted as a troublesome debate for Romney. Normally, if he can outshine his alternative, um, it doesn't mean that he has to hit a home run. He just needs to you know, make it to first base. Whereas here, you had Newt that was really hitting some home runs with some of his answers. And setting the immigration controversy aside, Newt's strong performance, I think, is making folks wonder if Romney doing fine is enough for him to be cemented in this frontrunner status. Now, coming into the debate, um, Romney was getting um, some media attention because uh, he was getting widely criticized for his one of his ads. He has a new ad out uh, that's a pretty harsh ad on Obama mm -hmm. um, that arguably quotes Obama out of context, taking a quote of his from 2008 that's about John McCain. Uh, saying that uh, if John McCain uh, sa says that if we talk about the economy, we're going to lose, or, or an aide of McCain at the time it was reported to have said that, and making it sound like Obama saying that today. Uh, and it seems like the condemnation has, has um, uh, spanned the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's actually uh, my, my The Weekend blog cons other conservative counterpart, uh, Matt Lewis, has a post at The Daily Caller where he says, it's titled, Calling Out Mitt Romney's Misleading Ad. Um, he says, that, you know, Team Romney is bragging that their misleading ad worked in case you missed it, the controversial, and he describes the ad. Um, and he says, this strikes me as the, the idea that the ad worked um, sort of only in this case is meaning that it got people to pay attention to it. But, you know, did it really persuade anyone? Um, and Matt says, you know, it's not as if there are plenty of legitimate ways to attack Barack Obama. The notion that one needs to embellish or invent things is absurd. Um, and that does this do long-term damage to the credibility of Romney's brand? And in a way, I think, I don't necessarily think it was completely unfair, because I think it's, you know, when many folks are watching these ads, I, I doubt anybody, like, really latched onto that quote. And it's like, oh, man, look, Obama's acknowledging that he can't talk about the economy. I mean, it was blended in with a lot of other clips. And I don't think it was that big a deal. Um, and, you know, I think it, it, it doesn't bug me so much, but I think strategically, yes, you're getting a lot of folks to talk about the ad, but um, not for the right reasons. And as a result, it's, it's making, you don't want to make Obama look sympathetic at all to swing voters. You know, you, you want to make sure that when you're taking your, your hits, that they're fair hits and that, you know, the other side can't say, well, well look at that unfair ad you did. Um, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, was, was it really necessary? Did it, did it win that much? So I'm not as, I don't come down as, as, as harshly on it as Matt does, but I do think that strategically, um, you know, this is now the story instead of, you know, is Obama really failing when it comes to economic policies? Now it's, did the, is the Romney campaign trying to pull a fast one on people? And I don't know that that's a, a narrative that's like winning New Hampshire voters left and right. Anyway, now Huffington Post's Jason Lincoln's made a similar point, um, actually saying the media wasn't giving it enough attention, it wasn't outright calling it a lie when they should be, um, and, and the Romney people sort of openly saying that they intentionally put something in there that pushed the boundary precisely to generate media attention and therefore saying that it worked and that the media coverage has, has, has echoed that point and, and um, uh, repeating Romney's words as if it's just sort of, you know, that's the way the, ga the game is played. Mm -hmm. uh, and... I, uh, my, my my personal take on it is is more uh, complex than that, uh, because if you look at, if you look at the ad, uh, technically speaking, they they date the quotes. They start the quote by saying, "Here's Obama mm -hmm. in October 2008 in New Hampshire," um, and then there's a string of quotes where Obama's talking about uh, how we need to fix the broken economy of 2008. Um, and the and the subtext unsaid is, you know, gee, Obama hasn't done any of these things that he said he was going to do. And then the last quote in that, that collage of quotes is the line about McCain without mentioning McCain's name. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from my perspective, it just sounds um, uh, convoluted uh, that the point that Romney was trying to, to make didn't no longer make any sense because you, you have a string of quotes from Obama – talking about the economy, <laughs> followed by quotes saying, if we talk about the economy, we're going to lose. You're like, what? what? That, does, that doesn't make any sense at all, because you just talk, I just remember the economy for a very long period of time on your ad. Uh, so I didn't, it didn't strike me as necessarily being uh, misleading. I thought it was just sort of a misfire on Romney's part, because the, you walk away from the ad not really understanding what Romney was trying to say. 
And, and I think the campaign tried to clarify it with, they, they, you know, they, they put out a press release with the ad where they, they, in the press release, make very clear that it's, it's taking the McCain quote. And the point there is that it's, it's trying to say, you know, Obama was, was making, you know, making fun of McCain for not being able to talk about the economy. But here's Obama talking about the economy, and yet people are not trusting him on it. Like, despite the fact that he keeps talking and talking and talking about it, I almost, I almost looked at it the other way, that he talks about it, um, but recognizes that it's a weakness because there hasn't been progress, or that there hasn't been, or voters aren't seeing that there's been any progress. So it, it is kind of a convoluted point to make in a, in a quick little ad. And so, you know, I, I guess in the sense, I mean, it was a very small ad buy. I think it was less than $200,000 buy. And now I'm sure this ad has been seen by far more eyeballs because of how this story is spread. Um, so it just depends if, if your philosophy is that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's better to, there, there's no such thing as bad publicity, then I guess it worked. I mean, I, mean, I don't think I mean, all I mean, of it's been bad publicity. Even there, the Politico said it, you know, sort of a savvy, brilliant move. I mean, there, there, you know, reasonable people can debate about whether or not it was a good or, or bad ad. I just, you know, does it, does it make the case that Obama is bad on the economy or does it now sort of confuse things? Like, I don't know that it makes the point much clearer. <laughs> but this is the the mo now with political campaign ads that you do you do a small buy, not necessarily intending to get, get it on a lot of TV airwaves, but you do something in it that pushes some sort of boundary to generate media coverage about mm -hmm. it, uh, and, and maybe that only works at a certain stage of of a campaign. But Rick Perry did that by calling Obama a socialist uh, very recently, um, and it's, you, you see it done a more. Uh, you know, bizarre ways, the famous demon sheep ad that you and I have uh, talked about before. And um, uh, in San Francisco, the, the, the victorious uh, mayoral campaign had this, uh, what was really quite, quite hilarious ad that featured uh, MC Hammer uh, and having a spoof version of Too Legit to Quit uh, with lots of bizarre, uh, you know, uh, fast editing and, and uh, uh, catchphrases <laughs> like "fear the mustache," uh, uh, so but these this is sort of the the new trend in political advertising, and it's 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 intended for niche audiences, whether it's a niche demographic like I think that San Francisco ad was, or the niche audience of the political elite to generate a certain kind of media coverage, like the Romney ad and the and the Rick Perry um, uh, Obama socialist ad. Uh, uh, whether it works or not, you know, it's, it's too early to say, uh, but it's, it's a definite shift. Usually political advertising is fairly uh, sanitized, uh, unless you're doing something really harshly negative um, you know, b below the radar. But you try not to do things that are going to get you in hot water, whereas or there's an ad to now. Let's do things that might get us in hot water because that gets attention. Well, it's the other thing that I think it, that we, we've overlooked in the, as a, a point to this ad is that Mitt Romney is running in a Republican primary in New Hampshire, and yet he doesn't mention any of his opponents. It's 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 not it's a general election ad being run in a primary campaign, and so I think in part you know if the goal is to get attention on this ad, um, so that the the political elite among us who are reading Politico, uh, you know, get wind of it, even though we're not in New Hampshire. Um, in a way, if, if the point is to get eyeballs on the fact that Romney is already trying to run a general election campaign, that's an interesting technique because then you're getting people to talk about you versus Obama, which is a dynamic that, that helps him in the primary. And as long as he is going after Obama, maybe try, helps him with some of these voters who might be skeptical about his conservative credentials. Because, hey, he's, he's, he's taken it to Obama. Great. He's, he's got the fight in him. Let's go. So from looking at this ad, which is a general election-ish ad, in the context of what he's trying to achieve in the primary, that, you know, taking the confusing line out of it, is that's what makes the ad really interesting to me and why I think, you know, maybe, you know, throwing in this line that's going to garner this attention um, winds up, you know, potentially being a savvy move if the point you're trying to convey is to a political elite or to a conservative primary electorate, I'm ready to take on Obama. So let's, let's start the general. And this is always, and this has been a strategy from the beginning. Using other web ads like this that are all very economy and jobs focused, to say I'm going to just have a laser focus on Obama and jobs and the economy, and I'm going to shrug off all the other hot button social issues. Uh, I'm going to dance around all of my past flip flops because I'm trying to show to the Republican electorate here's how I'm going to take on Obama. You know, singular focus on the economy, and that's the way to beat him. 
And and the, and the subtext there is it is an electability argument that this is the way to beat him, and this is, and you should be comfortable with me because I'm gonna I'm gonna do it right. Uh, and that seems to be upended uh, to, to circle back to our other discussion. If 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 the sense is who has the best ads, because ever since 1988, there's always been emphasis on your advertising. Uh, who has the more creative ad team? Because uh, because no one assumes that we're going to listen to your 90 minute debate performance. Uh, and now Newt's trying to turn that around, saying the debates are more important than your advertising because Newt's not doing any advertising; he barely has any money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, if conservatives uh, accept that premise, um, and Gingrich is certainly a livelier debater than Romney, as Romney may look good relative to Perry and Kane and Bachman because they're all crackpots, uh, and Romney at least looks like a reasonable uh, presidential type person. But, you know, Romney really has been put to test by someone who has s some grasp of policy <laughs> and some uh, energetic way of presenting it. And so that, that changes the dynamic for him. Yeah, I, I, I wonder to what extent. I mean, I'm sure that the Romney campaign has, you know, I've, I've used this description before, you know, binders upon binders upon binders of, of Newt Gingrich opposition research that, like, if, if we get... Let's say we get through Iowa. Let's say Gingrich wins Iowa, right. um, and Romney comes in third, and then we go into New Hampshire, and, and Gingrich is, is is a close second in New Hampshire. I think you start seeing them unload mm. all right. of the opposition research. Right. Um, but I think they'll hold off on doing that as long as possible, because what Gingrich has allowed them by by taking this immigration stance, what what the camp, Romney campaign I imagine is going to do is now instead of having to bring out the wives and all the more unseemly stuff that. You know, do you really beat up on a guy for for his marital past? I mean, isn't there a cleaner way to make a hit? Now Romney can take a clean hit on immigration um, and still not look like he's really going after him so much as just responding to the, the topic that's out there. So I imagine that the Romney campaign has a lot of fire that they're holding on to to see if Newt will just do the job for them and implode at some point over the next couple of weeks. Right. Uh, well, the other news this week, uh, outside of the other political news outside of the presidential race, was the end of the super committee, so-called super committee, uh, unable to come up with any kind of uh, plan to submit to Congress for an up or down vote. Um, and this has been uh, uh, cheered and jeered, depending on uh, uh, your vantage point. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, so, our conservatives. Were they accepting the Newt Gingrich line that the super committee was a, was a bad idea in the first place and we should cheer its demise, or uh, they are taking the opportunity to try to blame Obama and the Democrats for uh, not "quote unquote" exercising leadership, and uh, it's, as if that would somehow get Republicans to vote for something that they wouldn't otherwise vote on? Um, can Can the answer be both? Sure. Uh, you know, I I think that there are that there are some folks who are. Uh, you know, thought that this idea was dumb from the beginning, that it was a punt, that it was a continuing of a kicking a can down the road, that it was not creating any sort of, that there was, that there was just no chance that anything good was going to come out of this. Um, so you had a lot of folks who, at the super committee's failure, were, uh, it, it, Ed Morrissey at Hot Air, his post was one cheer for the super committee failure. Um, he says, we will hear a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth over the failure of the so-called super committee over the next several weeks in the media and from the Obama campaign most of all as a symbol of gridlock and partisanship. It's really nothing of the kind. It's a failure of responsibility ducking and blame shifting by Congress, and we should be cheering its failure. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of the, the reason why it's not super cheered is because there are these sequester cuts in many ways are going to go after defense. So you have Daniel Horowitz at um, Red State who is, says, you know, yesterday we observed the unique spectacle of a socialist president threatening to veto any bill that reinstates higher levels of spending. Did Obama just experience an epiphany? No, we are merely talking about cuts in defense spending. Those are the good kinds of cuts. And presents a number of charts to show that this is really going to gut um, defense budgets. On the other hand, you have um, Veronique de Rougie at uh, the corner who she says, I know I've said it before, but it's worth repeating. It seems to me Republicans' fears about the defense cuts in the sequester are counterproductive. No matter how you look at it, what the headlines are saying, under sequestration, according to the CBO, the Department of Defense will be spending more money in 2021 than it will spend in 2013. It's also important to note that the reduction in defense spending due to the withdrawal of troops in Afghanistan, troops in Iraq and Afghanistan have nothing to do with the sequester cuts. Um, so there's some folks think, of course we knew it was going to end. 
uh, badly. Other folks are upset about the sequester because of how it's going to go after defense spending cuts, or it's going to go after defense spending. And then you have others who are saying, you know, it's it's really not cutting that much. So you know, everybody don't don't panic. Right. Um, so and, and and you have, and I think the idea, I. I I was wondering if there would be any folks who would be excited because ultimately the trigger winds up being um, spending cuts only. I mean, there's no revenue increases from a sequester. It is just a spending cuts only plan. Um, but I think there's just frustration because it's so small relative to how the scale of how much government spending is growing um, that it's it's sort of an unsatisfying win. Um, well, there's or, also, if, if there's a win, also it's considered um, a win at all. There's also another trigger. Uh, yeah. there's, more, there's, more, there's more than one trigger here. Uh, and, you know, Lawrence O'Donnell gave a, um, a big commentary on his MSNBC show, The Last Word, about this. Ezra Klein had a blog about it um, uh, as well. Uh, you have, you have the, the, the spending cut trigger in the debt limit deal that you just talked about, sequestration, which is half military and half non-military, though it protects, it, it doesn't affect uh, Medicare and Social Security. Um, and but there's also the the second trigger, which is the expiration of the Bush tax cuts. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing that a lot of folks on the left were mad about uh, in the first tax cut deal in December uh, 2010, which said we're going to extend the Bush tax cuts for another two years. Well, those two years are coming up, and, and uh, as some have pointed out, uh, uh, that all Democrats have to do is literally do nothing, <laughs> prevent nothing from from passing. Uh, which you presumably can do whether or not Obama gets reelected. Uh, and there will be automatic major military cuts and uh, tax increases on the wealthy. You do have to combine them with some marginal tax increases on the middle class if you're eliminating all the Bush tax cuts. Um, and that might be uh, greeted with a relative shrug if the economy is better, if the economy is still is today, it might be seen as anti-stimulative. Um, so what the politics around that at the time are, 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 I think, a little unknown. But at minimum, they'd be happening in January 2013, two months after an election day, way before the next election day. So if any time you, you might you know, grit your teeth and allow that to occur, uh, you know, that would probably be the time. Uh, so there's a sense out there that Democrats actually have some of the negotiating leverage at this point. If you don't, if you don't want to see that happen and... And you don't, if you don't think Democrats will take that big a political hit for it because of the timing of it, uh, that might be very conducive to actually bring Republicans back to the Dale to work out some other kind of deal. Well, and, and, and in my mind, that explains a lot of the sort of lack of putting forward of ideas on the part of Democrats. Jennifer Rubin at, um, at Right Turn at the Washington Post, she has a whole post about, um, you know, who doomed the super committee. Um, there's been some talk that Senator John Kyle from Arizona doomed the super committee, and, and her post sort of talks to other folks that were on the committee and says, no, that's not the case at all. Um, and, and she finally gets, you know, if, for the end of her post, she says, perhaps Democratic Senators Patty Murray or John Kerry will explain why they never presented an entitlement reform plan or why they didn't make any move in response to the Toomey offer. Better yet, the White House might share why, for three years, Obama hasn't put up his own entitlement reform plan. But it doesn't appear that Kyle is the bad guy here. In fact, as the only member of the committee leaving the office, he had every reason to try to make a deal. There simply was no deal to be made with the Democrats and the absentee president. The idea being that Republicans are understanding what you're talking about, in addition to just having a natural inclination to wanting to cut, to want to cut spending and to want to reform entitlements. Um, and so there's just frustration that there, there's a sense that Senate Democrats did nothing um, to put forward their own ideas. That, that it's kind of, you know, if people are talking about Republicans won't compromise with what the Democrats want. But were we ever clear on what the Democrats on this committee did want? I mean, was there ever, here's our Democratic entitlement reform plan. Here's how we intend to create savings in Medicare and Social Security. I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for that, for, to see that idea. Well, and, according and to, we um, need that to be able to compromise. Well, according to Michael Linden at the Center for American Progress, um, they, they offered them what was the Bull Simpsons plan, uh, except it had less tax revenue. <laughs> it was actually a more conservative version of the Bull Simpsons plan, which a lot of conservatives claim that Obama should be embracing more strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it had um, uh, a change in the consumer price index that would affect that would that would effectively reduce Social Security benefits and. Um, 
it, it had cuts uh, to, to Medicare benefits in there, too. Uh, but the, the, the Democrat deal has always been this is true for what Obama proposed to Boehner during the debt limit deal and what Democrats reportedly proposed to Republicans in the super committee. We, we will take the heat. I mean, and the people I work with, the Campaign of America's Future, and, and most of the uh, you know, liberal base out there is utterly livid at the idea that Democrats were entertaining this at all. Uh, but they still were saying, look, we'll take the heat from, from our base on Medicare and Social Security if you take the heat from your base on raising taxes for the wealthy. Um, so I, 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 think it's, it's, I think it's hard to argue that, I mean, the, what, de- what Republicans sort of get a, an opening here is that Democrats have not literally written it all out on a piece of paper and, and paraded it from a TV camera and held it up to the light. But I don't think there's any serious argument that they didn't present this in a serious way in negotiations. And if Republicans really thought that deal was, was acceptable to them, they could say yes and it would be done. Well, why, well, why haven't they? You know, I mean... They don't oh, want to raise taxes. <laughs> That's no, no, why. No, 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 not the, not the Republicans. I'm talking about why, you know, why haven't the Democrats put it out there, you know, on on a piece of paper, you know, done the Paul Ryan, and and I get I get that it's for many of the reasons that you mentioned that there are triggers going off in the future that Democrats literally have to do nothing and they kind of get their way on a lot of things. Um, but I think that I, I wonder to what extent, I wonder who the blame will fall on. And I know, like, for instance, Megan McArdle, she's a, you know, a, a free market blogger who is sort of in a pox on both their houses mode right now. And I think that's probably how a lot of voters are, that it seems as though neither side has anything that they, you know, I mean, it, you have some individuals, like you have Paul Ryan, who put a plan forward, but that by and large, um, you know, she says, in a modern democratic state, there are two things true of any policy agenda, she said in a post um, from, from Monday. One, you eventually have to pay for it with actual money, and two, you have to get those bastards on the other side to agree with it, uh, and that there's a sense that neither side is living in that reality right now. And so we will continue on this train that is driving off a cliff because neither side understands that you, can't, you, you do have to pay for it with real money, and that money has to come from somewhere, um, but that, and that you can't just stick to your own ideas and, and, and not listen at all, which it sounds like the Democrats think would be a strategic advantage if, if I'm interpreting that as recline piece correctly, that if you do nothing, you rate, you know, the cuts aren't so bad, it's mostly in defense, which I don't perceive that is really upsetting to the left, and then you get these big, you know, 3.8 trillion in tax increases starting a year later. I mean, it, it seems to me that, I mean, I, I kind of am understanding her pox on both their houses mm-hmm. mentality because it seems like neither side really feels an incentive to do the right thing. Well, I think this is probably a little bit of an unknown. To what extent uh, is uh, the, the, the fallback with the, 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 what happens if you do nothing, quote unquote, you have a lot of military cuts and you have and you have tax increases on the wealthy by returning the Bush tax cuts. Uh, uh, to what extent what, was that the desired goal in the first place, and therefore this has all been a lot of song and dance to get there? Um, uh, or uh, to what extent was there a serious good faith effort on the part of the president of the Democrats to do the grand bargain, and this was only intended to be a fallback position? Um, uh, either way, um, the the idea is that at the end of the day, you, you cut the deficit. I mean, so... If you're talking about, you know, who was being the most uh, leaderly in terms of creating the deficit, what you, I think you at least have acknowledged that the president engineered a deal to say no matter what happens, we're going to cut the deficit, which is the kind of thing everyone always claims in the middle that we want Washington to do. And, and, and all we're debating is how do you do it? But we've locked in that you're going to do it uh, with this number. Uh, I wouldn't think that would be a, a, a thing to shrug off as an example of Washington not working. This should be an example of Washington working. Well, but I think if also $1.2 trillion in the grand scheme of things, large as that number sounds, is, is not very much, which is, is the other big thing that's hanging over this process. Is We can't even figure out how we're going to do $1.2 trillion in deficit reduction, and that is, I mean, that's not even cutting spending. That is reducing the growth of spending. So... I think that's that's perhaps the most depressing part of all of this is that, um, you know, without a grander grand bargain and without really having, I mean, if we're just talking about spending and taxes, if we're not talking full entitlements and long-term stuff, we're still just nibbling around the edges. Well, I, I, 
I think to the extent that there are people on, on, on in your side of the pool that sincerely believe that, if they want to get out of bed today and walk across the end of the pool and said, okay, let's let's do something Simpson Bowles like, Democrats would do it to the chagrin of many people on my side of the pool. Um, we, we may wind up getting there. You've seen a lot of these 2012 candidates on the Republican side also have very kind words for the Bowles Simpson plan. So I think maybe once we get a nominee, maybe there's more of a chance of having some some leadership on our side to, to drive something like this through. Well, well, perhaps, perhaps we should leave it on that note. <laughs> that was kind of a depressing note. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> We're going to run out of money. Yay. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see it the same way. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> we'll have a happy Thanksgiving. And if I can cheat and put it again in the last word. Yes, go for it. Um, I, also, I think we often forget that um, uh, Obamacare is deficit reduction, and while maybe we don't want to believe it, um, it is scores deficit reduction, and it is uh, many health care experts say it will do even more for deficit reduction than the CBO gives it credit for, depending on how well the experiments work out. And uh, even Paul Ryan says health care is deficit reduction, even though he disagrees with, um, the, with the Affordable Care Act. But that's also in place. There is something in place that is designed to cut the deficit, and that can be improved over time. And so another example of Washington working, in my opinion. There's lots of stuff happening to cut the deficit right now if only people would stop to look at it. That's your last word. That's you know, my last word. I, I, okay, well, I, I promised you the last word. I can't respond. <laughs> you can no, respond. Respond. I, no, I don't no, want to no, cheat. no, 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 no. I, I will. I will let you. I mean, we've we've already. You and I on the show have had the Obamacare debates a million times. So I won't bore the viewers with that. But. Well, I, I, I just wanted a happy note. <laughs> happy for one of us. <laughs> <laughs> someone, someone should be happy, right? Be thankful you know for me. I, I will say this. I hope. That if Obama gets reelected and Obamacare is in place, that you are right, and that it is deficit reduction. That, that, that is a gracious thing to say. I hope that you are right. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. Well, let's leave it on that on that thankful and hopeful note. Sounds good. Have a good one, Bill. You do, and, and enjoy my state. I will. <laughs> Take care.